what steps do you take to optimize your writing for sales? And then how do you balance that with good engagement? Because you do need to get some exposure onto the posts, right? Yeah, you definitely have to balance it because you need engagement to produce leads and you need followers to produce authority. So I'd say, you know, the biggest thing is if you treat it, you know, it sounds cliche because I've said it so many times in the past week to myself. Um, it's really spreading the content across the different pillars, um, like the personal content, trending content, opinionated content, social proof, case studies, video. When you spread it across a spectrum of all the different features that X has to offer, and this is why I love X, um, and the different styles of content, it brings in the different parts of the of the puzzle. So if you put out a piece of personal content, it's going to create some loyal followers. If you put out opinionated content, it's going to get you a ton of engagement. If you put out or with trending, if you put out some social proof content, it's going to nurture and convert that expertise. Same deal, right? So each pillar kind of has a different reason. So I think spreading out the types of content does all of those things. And if you're putting out enough content per week, like for us, if we're putting out 30 pieces of content and there's five pillars, I can put six of each. So now I can get one or one sixth of that week can be for lead gen. One sixth can be for, for sales. One sixth can be for followers. One sixth can be for engagement. Obviously it's not that perfect, but that's kind of the mindset that we have is if we spread out the content for the different concepts, it allows us to balance it. Interesting. So are there certain like tactical things that you're doing for sales? Or are you just kind of leaning into one of those or two of those different pillars that are more optimized for that? I'd say, you know, I think our sales process is, is shaped out to a point where it can take advantage of any of those. Um, it's not really tactical. It's like our goal is to just maximize everything to the best of our ability. Like if we get a ton of followers and like, if we go out in two weeks and gain, you know, a thousand followers and a ton of engagement, but we're not getting any sales, we're just going to tone it back. And like, how can we get sales? All right. We're going to go all in on case studies now that we got all those followers. Like it's not really <clears throat> super practical. It's like, we're going to go in with a balanced approach and then make adjustments from there based on the individual. Like, it's not really copy paste, which is also part of the problem with the scalability is like, you, there's so much nuance for every client. It's like you really have to create kind of these autonomous positions, um, these autonomous thinkers in your team because they have to make adjustments on the fly as well. So that's also part of the problem with scalability. It's interesting. Kind of goes back to what I was saying in the beginning is that you're way more like intuition based. And so in the way you approach business and like a company in a lot of ways is just kind of an expression of the founder or the CEO and like just an, uh, a scalability of his own or her own uh, philosophies and the way that they attack business. So for you to, I like that approach a lot for you where it's less like, Hey, here's exactly how we're going to do it for people. And it's like, let's just go in, throw a bunch against the wall. And then we manipulate and adjust, especially probably like on a client by client basis. Uh, but I want to go a little bit to like a personal branding standpoint. I heard you say that if you're trying to get clients on social media, building in public and documenting your journey is stupid. Can you unpack that idea a bit? Because building in public is something that gets talked a lot about these days. Yeah, I think building in public is kind of almost like your default settings. It's like when you unpack a new video game and you turn it on and it gives you all these default settings for my COD guys, like for sensitivity, uh, you know what I mean? Like that's kind of just like your default settings. When you get on social media, the first thing you're gonna do is document your journey. Like, okay. But it's not optimized for anything in any direction, right? It's not the best for growth. It's not the best for clients. It's not the best for networking. It's just like build, document your journey. It's like default settings when you absolutely have no experience and nothing to talk about. But in terms of optimizing for, for clients, it's like you need to have authority. And there's no authority in documenting your journey because nobody's documenting, nobody's documenting their journey verbatim to try to get clients. I think it's like, yeah, if you follow the content pillars of personal storytelling, you're, you're essentially documenting your journey, right? But when I say that, it's like, there's people out there who's like, their bio literally says documenting my journey. So I'm like, that's great. But if you want clients, it's not great. Like if someone goes to my bio and it says documenting my journey to a 50 K a month agency, like how it's like, so talk about a boner killer for like for like CEOs, right? Like someone with like a millionaire, seven or eight figure or nine figure founder 
comes to me and sees, says, documenting my journey to 10K a month. Like, why would they pay me? They just, you just instantly outed yourself as a beginner, right? So same with even SaaS, like documenting my journey to 3K, 5K MRR. And I, I know that I've seen so many of them. It's like, why would I use your software? I just know it's, I know you have no support. I know you're a one-man army. I know I'm just going to be your test dummy. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's not charity out here. So, you know, I don't think it's a good idea. And it's like, it's almost in the spirit of fake it till you make it. Like you need authority from day one. So like for me, my bio when I started was building seven figure personal brands. It's the truth. I was building seven figure personal brands. Had I built one? No. Was I building them? Yeah. So like I kind of weaseled my way into authority, right? Um, so yeah, don't don't do that. <laughs> there's a couple of things. It's like there's documenting your journey on the timeline. And then there's what you mentioned, which is like the super cringe version of that which is announcing that you're documenting your journey and like making that as like part of your bio and your brand. And listen, if you guys are, are listening to this and that's in your bio, like before this podcast is over, please remove that. Um, it's so, there's so many things wrong about it. Um, it feels weird. It reads weird. It's cliche. It's awkward. And like Marco said, like you're kind of outing yourself and that goes with the content itself too. Like those people that are like, just signed like my first client. And it's yeah. like, what do you think that client is yeah. thinking when they see you post that? <laughs> 3K paid in full. <laughs> like, dude, no. It's funny because I actually had this in my bio in 2017 or something like that. or 2000. Yeah, 2015. It's because Gary Vee was making it popular back then. But back then, nobody was doing it. So it was like, cool, document your journey. Like Everybody's like, oh, he's documenting his journey. I'm going to follow on. But now, it's like it's overplayed. It's, you know, the internet, social media has evolved, right? There's, you know, millions of creators now. Um, I know you do the roasting your profiles and stuff. Like that would be the first thing I'd roast if I saw that. hundred percent. And I've done that literally. Um, it's so cringy. Uh, Gary V was a huge inspiration for me around that time. Um, I don't know, 2015, 16, 17. And I wasn't looking for clients, Actually, what was interesting for me was I started documenting my journey in like an audio podcast form where I would do like five to 30 minute weekly rants, uh, essentially to myself. I would post them to iTunes and stuff, but I knew I had you know no listeners. I wasn't marketing it. I had like five or 10 people. What was cool about that is that all these years later, um, you listen to how I was speaking about my mindset about one day my grandkids will hear this. One day my audience, I'll have an audience that will listen to this. And I took those episodes and I started playing them in spaces with like some of my community and just streaming them through. And it was so meta. So there's actually something really cool about that. But again, your caveat was like, if you're looking for clients, don't do that. Um, if you're just trying to like put yourself out there and build a personal brand, sure, I guess, right? Because it just helps people get to know you a little better. Uh, but yeah, definitely be careful if you're trying to build a business on social and you're sharing a little bit too much about how much of a beginner you are, that can be dangerous. Um, with your regard, with your like personal outlook, um, a little bit broader with regards to money, I know you've always had this like abundance mindset for money uh, ever since you were a kid. And something that I struggle with that I think is one of your biggest strengths is that you're able to spend money super easily knowing that it'll come back to you tenfold, right? How can people, can people cultivate that mindset on their own? And how important has that been to your financial success? Yeah, I think it's been everything to my financial success. Like, I think part of the reason is that I don't spend money on like dumb shit. I don't buy designer. I don't buy watches. I don't buy anything crazy. I don't buy cool cars. So the only thing I spend abundantly on is experiences, travel, and business. So when it comes to those three things, I'm all in. It's the only thing I spend money on. So I think from day one, I just always was like, I need to risk it for the biscuit. <laughs> like I need to create my own luck. This has been like one of my models for a long time is create your own luck. And it's like, I can't, if I don't take any shots, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to score any points. So my, my philosophy has always been is I got to take as many shots as I know. I'm not Elon Musk level genius. I know I'm not, you know, I'm not even the hardest worker. So if I'm not the best at any of those things, then I, I can just take enough shots to score a lot of points. Like business is an infinite game. You don't have to 
score all your points in one game or you don't have to succeed in every business. You only have to score once, right? So if you just take a ton of shots, you will make one, right? So that was always my philosophy. And I, I treated that, I've done it so many times, had like 15 businesses. Uh, and then when I even got into crypto and stuff, like, which was my, one of my first big wins, it was like, I made like, I remember making like 50 grand one day and I just reinvested like 40. Like how many people would do that? Nobody. They would like withdraw 40 and then reinvest 10. No, I, was, I took 50 and reinvest like 48. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, so I think that's, I think that's been a huge part of my success, which is, and I also just bought every course. Like I'm so abundant with buying courses and stuff just to try and learn one thing. Um, so I think it's helped and compound enough knowledge to the point where I kind of got to a point where it's like, I can't even physically fail. Like you just have so much. That last point you made about courses. Um, I want you to talk a little bit about your networking strategy. Um, how you try to get close to people that are influential that you admire. Can you expand a little bit about how you do that with regards to courses? Yeah. Especially when, you know, I didn't really have anything to offer. You don't, you know, they always say the number one networking tip was always, and this has always been the same advice and it still is the same advice, but it's like, you have to provide value. But at a certain level, when you're at level zero, you're more annoying trying to provide value than anything. Like, if somebody DMs me, it's like, I want to give you, you know, free videos. Most of the time, I'm just like, that's more work for me than it's worth. You know what I mean? Like, I don't even want your free videos because I have to give you my attention. Um, so at that point, it's like, now what? If you can't even give someone something for free, which is like zero, how can you give value to someone if they won't even take it for free? So you have to go lower, which is negative. So you have to give them money. So I was like, okay. I have literally negative to offer. So I'm going to buy their stuff. Um, and I've done this multiple times buying people's courses. And of course they're appreciative of it and I get something out of it. So like I get the value of the course and the value of access to them. And then the, the second stud of that is that not only do you buy someone's course or community or something, you actually do the work when you get it and kind of become their star student. And, you know, naturally when you become someone's star student, they want to show you off. They want to show you off. They want to make you their testimonial. They want to make you their case study. They want to bring you on their YouTube channel and you get free exposure. So that was kind of my philosophy after years of failing. I used to buy courses, not talk to the founder, not talk to anybody in the course, not do the work, and then just move on to the next course. That's how I treated it for about three years. And then that's when it kind of clicked with me. It's like I could buy the course and network with this person and maybe be their friend if I get along with them. And it kind of worked out. So I just kept doing it. And I kept being people star students and you make money, you make relationships and you get the value back. So it's kind of like a networking hack. Yeah. And you've particularly done that with JK Molina and you've become kind of a lot of what you were saying there, I think is you were explaining your experience with him and his community. Um, can you talk about some of the specific things you did? Like, I know he would have like zoom calls and you were just like, Hey, I know that he needs engagement. So let me be asking questions. Like there are tactical things that you did to really like bring value to him. Right. Yeah. Well, I'll talk both examples. Like it's funny because my two, two, if not, yeah, my two basically closest friends in business right now are my friend Don Vo and my friend JK Molina, <laughs> but both, I did the exact same thing for both. So for JK, right. I bought his course or it was his community at the time. It was like 50 bucks a month. And not only did he need people to engage in the community to make it active, but like you, everyone, I mean, not everyone, but like, yeah, pretty much everyone's been in a zoom call, right. Where no one's talking or like the guy who's leading the zoom is like, does anyone have any questions? And then no one has a question. It's so annoying. So I just wanted to be the guy who always had a question because I, it's just familiarizing your face. And it also, they appreciate it. They're like, thank you for, speaking because you're making this an engaging conversation often once one person asks a question other people ask a question so i would show up to all the weekly webinars or zoom calls or whatever you want to call them and i would participate basically and that's it and you know as a matter of fact when you're the one who participates the most you usually get the best results you're actually active in the community asking questions being an active member you usually get the best results as well because you're being accountable so it was kind of a ripple effect and everything just started piling on top of each other. And I started to actually succeed while I was doing that. So then it kind of worked out that way. And, and you know, 
became his testimonial, blah, blah, blah. And then we ended up just becoming friends. Yeah. Now you guys have a podcast together and it's like a whole thing. And I experienced something similar with Alex Finn, where I got in his community for like five bucks a month and just started going in his video chat every single day, talking to the community, bringing value, like having conversations with people, attending all of the weekly calls. Uh, and then eventually, you know, we're doing all kinds of shows together or whatever it may be. Um, and yeah, there, there's a ton of value in that. Find people that you respect. That's one thing about the creator economy, right? Is we have access to these people for very low amounts of money. Um, if you think about anyone that you would admire in the business world, it's like you have no chance of getting in contact with Elon or Jeff Bezos or something like that. Obviously, that's an extreme. But like if there are some of these big shots on Twitter, for instance, you can spend a little bit of money, a couple hundred bucks maybe, and or even less and get into their like monthly subscription communities and start interacting, bringing value. And then all of a sudden they're putting you on, you know? Um, so to that note, I'm curious how you think about the future of X, everything Elon's doing to uh, create a financial application is really what it seems like he's gearing up towards, but they're gonna be adding more video and just, it's the everything app, quote unquote, it's kind of the vision. Where do you see that going? And then further, like, what is the upside in your opinion of having influence and a personal brand in the digital world that we're going forward into? Yeah, I'm obviously bullish on X, like an X agency. I'm probably one of the only X only agencies that are even out there. And I think part of that is was first mover's advantage, which is nice. Um, I'm bullish on it because I love the idea of the everything app. Uh, when I was in Singapore, I remember being in an Uber and it had the QR code to pay for the Uber using WeChat. Imagine I could be in an Uber and I could pay with Twitter or X, right? I could just scan my X and pay, boom, done. Or I could pay with Bitcoin, boom, done. Or Doge, boom, done. That's where it kind of clicked with me. I was like, if I could do that, there's so much more you can do. You could pay in the DMs. You could just, you could have subscribers. You could have ad revenue. And they started adding those things. Um, now they've added live streaming and they're adding video ads. And there's so much that they're adding. It's truly becoming the everything app and with payments, it's going to be a trading institution. There's going to be so many little things that are making it so big. And this is why it's growing so fast. Um, so that being said, I think it's important to have influence on this app because if everyone's going to be flocking to this, like my bull case is that in 10 years, this is the biggest social media platform. And if that holds true, especially with the integration of Web3, if Web3 gets really popular and X gets really popular, there's a ton of integration there you want to have eyeballs on the biggest app or on the biggest eyeball location. So for me, it's like, it's kind of like having digital real estate. So it's important to have a following, which is why I never discount the fact that we want to build followings and brands for our clients, because ultimately that's the long-term play, but we also want to do it in a cash flow positive way, which is why I focus on sales. Yeah. So I think, you know, this is why everyone's here, right? Is we're all here to kind of like build our brands up um, and that lead to business. But ultimately, if you have the brand, you can change the business, right? If you have the eyeballs and the attention and people care about you, then that's what gives you that freedom that you touched on earlier. It's something that I'm really focused on as well as helping people with that. So Marcos, I'm super grateful you came on the show. Uh, I am a big fan of yours. I love what you're doing with every part of your business. I like um, you know, just how young you are. It's amazing to see kind of the quick progression you've gone through the way you like latch on to trends and to, to just the nuances of how business works. Uh, you're not really attached to like one thing. You're just always experimenting and, uh, you're so open with your knowledge as well. Um, and I'm excited for you and your girlfriend as things go forward, because that's definitely something I'm looking forward to like to having is something, a similar dynamic to you. So, uh, I look up to you in a lot of ways, man, and I'm grateful that you came on the show. So I'd love for you to, uh, if you if you can, um, if you have any words of encouragement for up and coming content creators and just maybe something that's been on your mind that has helped you and then where people can find you online to connect. Yeah, I think like, you know, the biggest piece of advice and this is kind of a new piece of advice that I have is just don't be afraid to. It's funny. It's like, what is it? What's Chamath that said it? Get in the arena and try things. It's like, don't be afraid to experiment and don't be afraid to go against the grain with the things that you're doing. I think a lot of the tactics that you're typically going to see are either going to be old or kind of ineffective. I think don't be afraid to do 
the dirty work. Don't be afraid to try to get on the spaces floor. Don't be don't be afraid to try to be the first one to reply to Elon Musk tweet. You got to get gritty and you got to get down and dirty if you want to kind of arrive like rise through the ranks. Like you like buy the courses and become the star student. Get on the Twitter space floor and say something crazy. You know, be the first one to reply on the big accounts. You got to do that dirty work, and I think that gets discounted a lot um, for people growing on X. Um, and where you can find me is it's Marco Ceriz on all platforms and thebirdhouse.co. Awesome. We'll have those links in the description. Marcos, thank you, brother. I appreciate your time and talk soon. Cheers.